Liberal Viewer presents. So in high school and college, I was always taught that the way the United States got out of the Great Depression was through government spending. First through spending on public works projects, and eventually through spending on World War II. And that only makes sense because that kind of spending gives people jobs and their own money to spend, which makes the economy grow. In recent years, however, some right-wing Republicans who are ideologically opposed to government spending have tried to challenge this conventional Keynesian wisdom by claiming the solution to bad economic times is actually to slash government spending, as exemplified by satirical conservative pundit Stephen Colbert last week in this clip. In bad times, you have to slash government spending. Now, I don't need some fancy Ivy League paper to tell me that, because there is already a fancy Ivy League paper to tell me that. <laughs> the famous 2010 study, Growth in a Time of Debt, by Harvard economists Ken Rogoff and Carmen Reinhart. And you gotta think, Harvard economists understand debt almost as much as Harvard graduates. <laughs> and Stephen Colbert's satirical conservative pundit is not the only right-winger depending on Harvard economists Reinhart and Rogoff. A lot of the Tea Party's anti-government rhetoric has relied on the same statistic about the bad effects of government debt, as MSNBC anchor Chris Hayes pointed out last week on his new show, All In with Chris Hayes, in this clip. Ever since the Tea Party insurrection, conservatives have had a favorite statistic. It is not the number of gun deaths in Chicago, which has relatively strict gun laws, or how much money from Medicare is used to fund Obamacare. It's this. Independent economists have found that debt loads greater than 90% of GDP could result in the loss of up to a million jobs. Once a country's debt burden reaches 90% of the economy, you have a significant <coughs> downturn in economic growth. Economists who have studied sovereign debt tell us that letting total debt rise above 90% of GDP creates a, a drag on economic growth and intensifies the risk of a debt-fueled economic crisis. Hmm, so given how common that conservative mantra was about the bad effects of government spending reaching 90% of a nation's gross domestic product, if it hadn't been for the Boston Marathon bombing, an important piece of news might have gotten more coverage this month, as Chris Hayes went on to explain in this clip. An incredible thing happened last week, and it was drowned out by lots of other news, but honestly, it's one of the most astonishing things in recent economic history. A grad student, Thomas Herndon, a 28-year-old at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, had an assignment rerun someone else's data and see if you can get the same results. Herndon chose the Reinhardt Rogoff study. He looks at an Excel spreadsheet. We've all seen them. And the first thing he sees is the crucial column in their data, the one that averages the growth rates of countries with debt to GDP ratios of 90% is wrong. That's right. The conclusion of that big paper from the conservative Harvard economists Reinhardt and Rogoff were based in part on a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet error. And Chris Hayes went on to deliver the punchline here. So here's the punchline. If you correct the spreadsheet error and put the intentionally omitted countries back into the data set, the entire statistic falls apart. Instead of countries with the dangerous level of 90% debt to GDP having a negative growth rate of 0.1%, they have a modestly positive growth rate of 2.2%. That is a big freaking difference. That's the difference between recession and recovery. And that's right, too. The difference between recession and recovery is a big frickin' deal because this Harvard study has been relied on throughout the media, as you can see from the dozens of citations on this page, and beyond the media, actual policymakers, not just in the United States, but also in Europe, have relied on this statistic to justify austerity measures, as Stephen Colbert pointed out back in this clip. Not only, <laughs> not only has Congress been inspired by Rogaine and Braveheart's math. <laughs> Their work has influenced international budget slashers like EU Economics Commissioner Oli Rehn, former European Central Bank President Jean-Claude Trichet, <laughs> Bundesbank President Jens Wiedmann, and Lord Lamont of Lerwick, <laughs> who is not only the former Chancellor of the Exchequer for the United Kingdom, but gets killed by Lady Mary in the next season of Downton Abbey. <laughs> <laughs> but what's not so funny, as my European viewers know so well, is that these European policymakers have slashed government spending to try to lower government debt and avoid the dreaded Reinhardt Rogoff debt level, even though it turns out that cutting spending ends up slowing economic growth and actually ends up increasing government debt, as former Obama economic advisor and former Harvard president economist Larry Summers pointed out in a CNN interview in this clip. There's a striking fact 
the countries that have pursued the most austere policies as measured by the change in their fiscal position are the countries that have had the biggest increases in their debt to GDP ratio. It's not just that austerity is adverse for growth and for jobs. In many cases, it seems as if austerity is adverse for its very objective of bringing down debt burdens. Hmm, and there's plenty of data to back up what Larry Summers was saying there, which will hopefully change the minds of some of those who want to slash more government spending back here in the U.S., because there's nothing magic about a country's debt level reaching 90%, as Stephen Colbert pointed out back in this clip. Herndon's corrected spreadsheet show that countries with debt over 90% did not see their economies shrink minus 0.1%, but instead saw them grow 2.2%. But come on, 2.2% up. 0.1% down. You say potato, I say eliminate food stamps. <laughs> now, I hope those who want to slash food stamps and other government spending will change their opinions based on this new data, but unfortunately, Reinhardt and Rogoff themselves are still sticking with their conclusions, as Stephen Colbert satirized here. But folks, Siegfried and Roy are standing <laughs> by their results, saying, quote, the weight of the evidence to date including this latest comment by Herndon, seems entirely consistent with our original interpretation of the data. Right, entirely consistent with their interpretation, because no matter how much the results change, the hypothesis must remain the same. That's science. <laughs> I guess that's conservative science anyway, or at least it sometimes seems that the right has the most committed ideologues who stubbornly stick to their right-wing economic dogma even when their evidence is shown to be erroneous. But outside the ideologues, the real data about the effects of cutting versus increasing government spending fits what also seems like common sense, as Stephen Colbert learned when trying to use the illogical arguments of the right wing in his interview with Thomas Herndon, the grad student who found the spreadsheet error, in this clip. Right, I know. We have to keep cutting the government budget and laying off people until those people get jobs. Yeah, that, that seems to be the argument, but yeah. it just it doesn't seem argument. plausible just, yeah. to me. I tend to think that if we lay off a lot of people, um, then it's not really good for the economy, because then those people can't go out and participate and buy things. You know, that's really bad for businesses as well. If you're just going to use complicated economic jargon, I can't understand a thing you're going to say. <laughs> and that's hopefully why right-wing austerity advocates will lose this argument. Not because of the discovery of a spreadsheet error in an academic paper which will never change the minds of the committed ideologues, but because the old Keynesian idea that government spending stimulates job creation and growth just makes more sense than the idea that government austerity is the solution to an economic slowdown, I think, but I want to know what you think. Do you agree with the old Keynesian idea that government spending can be an effective tool to stimulate job creation and economic growth? And Given the discovery of this spreadsheet error and the other evidence of austerity's ineffectiveness, do right-wing austerity advocates really think they are promoting economic growth, or do they generally have some other goal? I, YouTube, you decide.